Hello, hello, how's everyone doing? God bless you. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Good to see you. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. How you doing, Jackie? Good to see you. How you doing, Peter? All right, all right. Elky, how are you doing, Elky? Good to see you. Judith, good to see you. Monique, how you doing, young lady? Happy Sabbath. Adrian, happy Sabbath. Good to see you guys. All right, all right. Carol, good evening, Carol. Good to see you. All right. All right, where's everybody at? Where is everybody at Henville? How are you doing? Good to see you. Carol, Sagithia, Dr. Cam Cam, how are you? Good to see you. All right, all right. All right, getting everybody on. All right. Who else is coming on tonight? Kind of low tonight. Media, how are you? We're doing Revelation chapter 2, so please get your Bibles. Get your Bibles, please, please, please. Okay? All right, so that we can study together the church of Ephesus, the first church. Remember the seven churches. Okay? All right. Gina Bosse. How you doing? Raquel Ruff. How are you, young lady? Good to see you, part of the Hanford people. Got Adrian and Raquel all the way from Hanford, California. They're in different places now. All right, good to see you guys. Sonia, I missed somebody who just came on there, missed them. And um, all right, Friday night. Everybody is uh, sort of hiding somewhere. Okay, let us have a word of prayer, people, so that we can we can start. Okay, let us have a word of prayer. Um, Revelation chapter two. Let us pray, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today to study your word. We ask, Lord, to be that you may lead us, that you may give us wisdom. As we study your word, we ask all this today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Baby. So let us, uh, Onika, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Revelation chapter 2. Okay. Revelation chapter 2. We're going to go into, into the church of Ephesus. Okay, the church of Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Remember that the letter was written to uh, different churches, okay? The letter was written to different churches, and uh, um, and the churches... Could you guys hold on a second, please? We I have uh, somebody in my house that are talking, and I can't... Uh, All right, let's get back. Let's get back. <laughs> Sorry about that, okay? Sorry about that. All right, let's go. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, okay? To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right, okay? Rainier, how you doing? Anna, good to see you. All right, people coming in right now, okay? So, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, tells us the following, Okay? tells us, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, okay, uh, write to the, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, so first of all, we see here, how you doing, Joan, good to see you, so the, I, the way that Christ is identified into the church of Ephesus, because in, in, in every church, you're going to notice that Jesus is identified in a different way. 
in the church of Ephesus, it says there are things he, who, th these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So in the church of Ephesus, Jesus is identified. Remember, he who holds the seven stars, and remember the seven stars were a symbol of the seven leaders of the church, okay? And walks in the lampstands who were who represented the churches, okay? So here to the church of Ephesus, Jesus introduces himself in chapter 2, verse 1. He introduces himself as one who is among the church, one who has the messengers and the leaders of the church in his hand, and one who is walking within the church. People there, a lot of times we think that church is out of control. Sometimes we think we see the church and we see all kinds of things going on, but we have to understand that Jesus is in control, that Jesus is walking within his church, and that Jesus is leading his church. As you go back in history, you're going to see many changes that were made from the primitive church to then Catholicism to then Protestantism to then all these different movements, denominations, and all these things. But God always seems to have His people, and His people is not uh, is not by by a denomination. See, God, there's something called the invisible church. And the invisible church is made by people who are part of the body of Christ. And no matter what, no matter where, God has his people. People will try to destroy the church. People will try to mess up. You're going to see hypocrites. You're going to see people who are abusive. You're going to see all these things. But Jesus is in the midst of his church. His church. Okay? So... If we see this now, now we go to verse number two. So the identification of Jesus, of the church's Ephesus, is the one who has the seven stars in his hands and stands within the candlesticks. Okay? All right. Uh, verse two. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and, what you, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. This letter is written to the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus has certain good things and has certain bad things, okay? Certain good things and certain uh, uh, bad things. You know what? Before we continue, I, I, wanted, I wanted to mention something to you that I completely forgot, okay? Uh, I didn't forget, but I was going to do it and then started the, the lesson. I wanted to mention to you guys that we really need to pray for Merva, okay? Uh, Merva, Merva's in the hospital. I went over to see her, uh, about an hour ago. Um, and Merva's not doing, not doing good right now. Okay. Uh, she had this UTI and this UTI turned, you know, it infected her and her heart is not doing good right now and her kidneys are not doing good. All right. So we need, we need to pray for Merva. Okay, we need to pray for Merva, and and you know what? I I want to stop and pray for Merva right now. Merva's right there. Merva's on. She's at the hospital, but she's on. Okay, and um, I want to pray for Merva, and I want all of you guys to pray for Merva, and I want Merva to to uh, to do good soon. Okay, so I I want to take this time right now that you guys are on because I was waiting, I was waiting for more of you to come on. Uh, so that we could all pray together, and uh, and we're going to pray right now. Let us bow heads and pray for, for Merva. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being our God. We thank you that we can always trust in you, Lord. And you, Lord, know how Merva is feeling right now. You know what she's going through. You know what this infection has done. You know exactly what she needs, Lord. And I ask you, Lord, that you may bring healing to her kidneys. She needs to restore them. She needs to get them back to where they need to be. I ask you, Lord, to please work also with her heart, 
that she may be able to restore this blood pressure in her heart, that she may be able to restore these kidneys, Lord, and whatever this infection has done, that you may restore it completely because you are our God. You are always there with us. You love us. And I know you love Merva. And I know, Lord, that you can heal her and have power and authority over every infection and over every disease, Lord. And I ask you now, Lord, to be with Merva. I ask you to bring healing upon her. I ask you, Lord, that she may feel your presence with her in a great and powerful way and that you may touch her every cell of her body, every organ of her body, and that you may bring healing in her, Lord, from the top of her head to the, to the tip of her toes, Lord. You can bring that healing and we bring her to you and we put her in your hands, Lord, and I ask you to bring some healing upon her in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, people, we, and, and I want you to, guy, for, for you tonight to keep on praying for Merva. And um, I, wa I know we're going to see a big change tomorrow. I know that we're going to see a big change. And I know that everything is going to be good, Merva. Merva is going to be good. Okay. Let us... Um, let us go back. Let us go back to the book of Revelation. Okay, Revelation uh, verse 2. Here's the situation. I want you to see this situation that's going on in Revelation chapter 2 and the letter to um, in the letter to Ephesus. Okay, this is the church of Ephesus, and here's the message: Jesus is represented by the one holding the stars and the one walking within the candlesticks. It says, I know your works. Jesus says, I know you, church. I know you, church. You la your labor, you, 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 I know your labor. I know your hard work. I know your hard work. I know your patience. Patience is consistency. So look at Ephesus, people. Ephesus looks like a very, very good church. I mean, I see this church and I say, I want my church to be like this. It says, it works hard. It is, I know your labor. I know your patience means consistent. I know, look what it is. Look what it is. I know that you cannot bear those who are evil. This church has a problem with those that are evil. In other words, it does not allow evil people to come in there to destroy the church. So it's a hardworking church. It's a church that watches out for evil to come into the church. It says, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. Why? Because in those days, uh, certain false people used to come and to try to trick the church and try to destroy the church, Okay. And sometimes people will come and try to destroy the church. And the church of Ephesus had people say, listen, you test them and you find out that they're not real apostles and you have found them liars. In other words, it was a church that doctrinally, biblically, it was ready. It was able to test people. It worked hard. It was right in its doctrines. It had everything down packed. Look at verse three. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Up to verse 3 here. It is a good church. Listen, people. Listen up now. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. That you can have a church that is sound doctrinally. In other words, and doctrine is right. In recognizing false preachers, and false apostles is right. In protecting the church in itself is right. The church works hard. The church uh, puts a building project together and builds a big church. And they build a big church. And they have a nice church. Oh, and the members there, they work for each other all the time. And they just, and they just have this new church. And they're proud about their church. 
And oh my God, the church, you know, you got the best sound. You got the best sound system and you study hard the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and you are, and you are set up. You know the Bible up and down and you know, and you know what Jesus expects of you. And that church is always doing seminars and seminars on finances and seminars on, on, uh, on, on prophecy and, and seminars on finances and seminars on marriage and the work and the church is, is working for itself and they're seminaring each other to death. I mean, and they're just going at it and learning and learning and teaching each other. And this church knows the Bible up and down. But look at verse four. You guys ready? What does verse four say? Huh? Read that. It had a problem. It had a problem. Hey, Dana, how you doing? Revelation chapter two, verse four. This church of Ephesus had everything doctrinally. It had everything doctrinally. It was set up. Oh my God, what an awesome church. Its doctrine was perfect. All these things were perfect, but verse four said, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You have left your first love. You see, people, good doctrine without love is no good. A powerful church that doesn't love, it's no good. The first love, a lot of times, is, is, um, is referred to as when you, like, you know, fall in love with God the first time. And you fall in love with God the first time. Uh, you... When you fall in love with God the first time, it's like you just want to tell everybody. You just want to tell everybody. It don't matter who they are. You want to speak to the drug addict in the corner. You want to speak to your neighbor. You forgive all your family's issues. You forgive your friends. And you just want everybody to go to heaven and your heart is open. But then you're in your church a few years and you begin to think you're better than other people because now you're a Christian. And you begin to say, well, how could they not be a Christian? And you start forgetting about how, how when they used to tell you about Christ and you rejected it yourself. Now it's like, how could they reject Jesus? And all of a sudden, after a while, your head begins to get big because now, see, before you were so humble, you didn't know the Bible. Oh, but now you know Daniel. Now you know what the beast of, of Daniel is. Now you know what the lion and the leopard. Now you know the image, what the gold and the silver means. Oh, now you know all this stuff. Now you know the book of Revelation. Yo, yo, you know about the Sabbath. You know about the Bible. Oh my God, you know all these things. And all of a sudden, you begin to feel like you're favored by God you know, and that, and that, and that you're special and you begin to look down upon other people. Well, how could they not know about this, you know, and, and, and how disobedient they are to God. And, and then you start putting down other people and you, and somehow you begin to feel exclusive, exclusive, you know, and, and how could they be like that? See, when you look at somebody like that, they look like this church of Ephesus, right? Because they, they dress right. They dress right. They drive the right car. They know how to carry the Bible on their arm, under their arm perfectly. They speak properly. They stay away from anything that is wrong in this world. And you look at them and their family looks so good. But they lack something. 
they lack the love of Jesus for others. See, a church is supposed to be inclusive, but churches turn out to be exclusive. Starts out with the mentality that my denomination are, we are God's people. We are God's only people. So if you want to go to heaven, you got to go in through this door. See, it's, it, it begins, it goes through that. And they begin to be exclusive. They begin to love their doctrine more than they love God. They begin to love their denomination more than they love God. And then they begin to love their doctrine more than they love people. Because they begin to see people who don't live according to what their doctrine says and they put those people down. And we forget people that Jesus came down to God. God, Jesus, all powerful. And one, and one of Jesus, that they, one of the accusations they made to Jesus was that he hung out with the wrong people. He, he hung out with prostitutes and publicans, and publicans were, were, were tax collectors who were cheaters. Okay? Do you, do you understand that? And they criticized Jesus for that. But you see, Jesus saw people as his children that he loved them. He says, I came to save what was lost. And Jesus, who was God all powerful, there was no person in this world that he didn't love. I think uh, 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 Dana, you put you put something today up on um, on one of your posts. How about about how we are all connected? We are all connected as human beings, and, and I like that because I, I see that's that's one of my beliefs. One of my beliefs is very simple. One of my beliefs is is that if if we really believe in the Bible, and we really believe that God created Adam and Eve and then we all come from Adam and Eve, we're all blood brothers and sisters. See, I believe that. Because I believe the biblical story. I believe the biblical story that, that God created Adam and Eve. And if God created Adam and Eve, and we all come from Adam and Eve, then somewhere, somehow, Adam and Eve are the parents of all of us. Of all of us. It's very simple, don't you think? Doesn't it make sense? We're all family. If you believe, if you believe that God created Adam and Eve and that we all come from Adam and Eve, then obviously, obviously, Monique, you and I Monique, you didn't know it, but you're my sister and I'm your brother. <laughs> Simple as that. Gina and Carl, we're family. Dana, we're family. Merva and Jackie, we're family. If we believe, if we believe the Bible story. To me, it's very simple then we're all family. So you see people, we're supposed to love each other like family. The Ephesus church had a problem. The Ephesus church had a problem that it was proud. It was, the Ephesus church was proud. They were proud of their humbleness. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen some people that are so humble that they're proud? They say that <laughs> they're so proud that, you know, but they say they're humble. And I tell them, yes, you're, you're, you're proud of your humbleness. They were so proud because they, they believed the right thing. They had the right doctrine. They had, the, they had a big old church and they had all these things. And they had, you know, there were uh, uh, all these things and, and, and all the, you know, you know, they had so many things. You know, it looks, you look at a church and it looks so good. 
But you see, Jesus looks deep inside. Jesus looks deep inside. And he says, I know you. And you're missing love. You seem like your church is so organized. Everything is right down. Everything is lined up properly. But you're missing love. You see, people, love is the essence of the Christian church. It is. Love is the essence of the Christian church. What did Jesus say? If you love one another, they will know that you are my disciples. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. See, see, pe people are supposed to re recognize that something special has happened in us because of how we love people. And I'm not talking about how we love each other in church. I'm not talking about how we love each other in church. I'm talking about how we love those who believe completely contrary than us. See, your love is not demonstrated or shown by you loving people who think like you. No. Your true love is shown in how you love somebody who thinks completely different than you, dresses completely different than you, looks completely different than you, Things completely different than, than you. How do you love that person? See, that's where love is tested. That's where love is tested. I mean, could you imagine Jesus, how he thought and how we thought, and yet he came and he spent time with us? How could Jesus even stand listening to our stupidities? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought like, you know, Jesus being here on earth, right? And he's all powerful God. <laughs> you know, knowing every, I mean, being, oh my gosh. And listening to our stupidities. Listening to human beings talk junk. Things they don't even know. And yet he sat there and he took it. He took it. He heard it. He paid attention to them. And he actually made them feel like they were important. And he actually made them feel like what they said was important. You know what, people? There are so many times that we, uh, that we talk to people and we have a time with people and we spend that time telling people about us. Oh, I did this, I did that, and we, and we, and we just can't stop talking. But it's good to sit down and, and let the other person talk. Listen to other people. Ask them questions. Let them talk about themselves. Instead of us trying to give our opinion and trying to tell people how much we know and trying to give our story and trying to give whatever. But you know why I get that? Because Jesus, his love, he was in love with us and he came and he listened to us. He listened to human beings. He listened to us. Because of his love. Because of his love. We need, as a church, to have love. Not for just those who think like us, but for those who are different than us. Those who may be atheist. Those who may be, I don't know, whatever it is. But like I said, we're all brothers and sisters. 
And we need to be inclusive, not exclusive. All right. Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Then it says, verse 5, remember, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. It says, remember when you first were, remember when you first got baptized? Remember how you felt that day? Remember how 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 you were? Remember how, how soft your heart was? Remember how you felt? And Jesus says, go back to that day. Go back to that experience when you ask yourself, Jesus, you have accepted me. Why do you even accept me? I am not even worthy. Thank you, Jesus, for accepting me. And Jesus says, go back to that same attitude. Go back to that attitude of thankfulness that you don't deserve it, but you have it because that attitude is going to help you to accept other people who are completely different than you. He says, go back to that attitude. Go back to that first love. Go back to recognizing what God has done for you and that you don't deserve it. Go back to that attitude. Because what happens is that many people, after many years, they begin to think that they actually deserve what they have. They actually begin to think that they deserve. Oh, but Jesus says, go back. Go back to when you first were converted. Go back to that first feeling. Go back to that feeling of unworthiness. Go back to that feeling and say, God, thank you for saving me. Only your forgiveness can save me. He says, go back to that same thing. You know why? Because that spirit and that feeling oh, will help you to accept so many people. I remember one day I, I went to a, 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 after I became a pastor, I went to, um, to preach at a youth retreat. It was a big youth retreat here in Florida. And uh, when I went there, um, you know, there were, I don't know, seven, 800 youth there. And uh, I, had, I had, you know, been here in South Florida, West Palm Beach area and all that. Then I left to Puerto Rico and, and then I started traveling around, went to New York went to different places, went to Mexico, and uh, then finally graduated in Southern. And, and then after that, I went to Philadelphia. And then from Philadelphia, I went to California. And then from California, they invited me out here to uh, preach at a re re retreat. So friends that I had grown up with in the, from the area of like Miami and that kind of stuff, uh, friends that you know, we grew up as, as young men, um, and it was, a, it was a, a time in my life where I, I wasn't into church that much. Uh, and, and me and this friend of mine, we used to, you know, we used to party together, okay? We used to party together and do a lot of stuff that I don't talk about anymore, anyway. So, um, then he, he sees me, and in fact, in fact, Raquel and Adrian here, I was pastoring in Hanford. I was pastoring the Church of Hanford during that time. And I came here to, uh, to preach for the youth retreat. And um, he was there. My friend was there. Now, he had gone back to church also, and he was a good Christian in church now. And um, so he saw me, hey, we saw each other. He's like, he's like, oh, Johnny, man, what's going on, man? I, you know, I, I can't believe you became a pastor. Wow, that's amazing. You know, we hadn't seen each other maybe 10 years. He's like, I can't believe, you know, you're a pastor, man. I see you preaching up there. I had never heard you preach. And, and you know, we were, re, you know, reconnecting. And, and then he begins to tell me, he says, you know, man, the youth are so bad now. You know, the youth in church are, 
are just doing this and doing that. They don't respect the church. The youth are not respecting. The church is doing this. The youth are doing that. You know, ah, and he's talking about all these things, you know. And I was looking at <laughs> In my mind, I was thinking, I was, I was like, bro, do you forget the things we used to do? Do you forget why we would visit churches and go in churches and and then come out and we didn't go there for the sermon, you know? I mean, I mean, do you, how do you forget how we were? I mean, we we weren't good people. Do you forget that? And what happens, people, sometimes we, we forget. And this church's message to the church of Ephesus is to Christians who forget. They forget who they were. They forget where they were saved from. They forget what they were saved from. And you know, my life, the direction that it was taken, is like, I'm a, I'm a piece of charcoal that was burning in the fire and, and the Lord came and then he took it out and he burned his fingers for me to take it out. And he took me out of there and he put me somewhere else where I am today. See people, I never forget that. I never forget who I was. I never forget what my life was. I never forget where God went to get me. I didn't go after God. God went and got me out of the fire. I wasn't searching for him. I didn't want him, but he wanted me. And I understand how a lot of times, and, and the mothers that are here from the church, they usually come to me and they start telling me about their children and how bad their children are and how much we need to pray for the children because how bad their children are. And I let them know, I let them know that it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Continue to love them because if God saved me, and I'm a pastor today, believe me, your son or daughter has hope. Because none of their stories have ever been worse than mine. As they're telling me these stories, none of their stories are much than, are worse than mine. None of them. Let us never forget where we come from. Let us never forget where God has saved us from. Because that's what creates something in us that accepts people from all walks of life. From all walks of life. One of the things that helped me that God gave me a great family. But not everybody has had a great family. We're not all the same. No, we're not. We're not all the same people. Stop thinking that if, that if just because you put yourself up by your bootstraps that everybody else should. Hmm. Some people 
I have worked in the, as a Bible worker in the worst parts of Brooklyn, East, South Brooklyn, Williamsburg. I have, worked, I have worked in the worst parts of New York, in the worst parts of Philadelphia. I have been with, with, with kids brought up in gangs. I have been studying with children of prostitutes. People, I have, God has put me in the worst places of this world and I thank him so much because he has taught me so much. He has taught me so much. And when you see these people, see, see, sometimes people, you know, a lot of Christians, they lock themselves up into this Christian little box and you have never left it. I thank God that God allowed me to see so many things and so much pain and so much suffering that God has allowed me to be able to to experience these things because it allowed me to see how lucky I am, how thankful I should be, and how we need to give to so many people in this world what this world has never given them. And I know that some people take me wrong when I say that the gospel is the answer to all the problems that we have today. I know that I'm judged wrong when I say that. But the problem is that there is a lot of people, the church has not done its job right in loving people. And that's why there are so many people that have been hurt through the ages because the church has not lived out its gospel. The church of Ephesus, the message to the church of Ephesus is a message to Christians who, because of their position now, have grown big-headed and have forgotten, forgotten where they come from. Don't forget, don't forget who saved you. Don't forget how he saved you. Don't forget where you were. And then it says, says verse, um, Six, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, of which also hate, you know, those are wrong teachings. Nicolaitans were teaching the wrong things. Then it says, verse seven, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To whom who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of, li from the tree of life which is in the midst of paradise of God. It says to he who overcomes. Overcomes what? What is the theme? What is the theme of Ephesus? Look at the verse seven, please, please, please read verse seven. Can you go there? He who overcomes. I will give to eat of the tree of life. What are you talking about? Overcoming. Overcoming what? What? Yourself. Your ego. Your exclusivity. Thinking you're better than anyone else. And returning to your first love. Returning to love of the, loving others, accepting others. Not judging. Seeing every single person as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Seeing somebody. 
seeing somebody out in the street being the worst person in the world, then when you look at them, you see that person serving God. Can you see that? Are you able to see that? Are you able to see someone in prison serving God? Are you able to see someone who thinks completely different than you? Can you see somebody who sells drugs and, you know, serving God? Can you, I mean, I mean, th that, that's what love does. You see a person and you can see not just what they show. You can see something else. Oh, you, you, you can see something else. You can read between the lines and you can see that that person is a son and a daughter of God. And all this crap they show here, it's a defense mechanism. It's how they survive. It's how they live. A soldier is not the shield that he has in front of him. A soldier is not the helmet. A soldier is not his gun. When you take the helmet away, when you take the gun from his hand, when you take his shield off, back there, it's just a young man, a young man with a heart, with a mind, with dreams, and with desires. Never let the shield that people put up in front of you make you believe that that's really them. Never believe that the helmet that they use to protect themselves is really them. Under that helmet and under that shield, there is a real, real person. Verse 7 says, he who overcomes. But overcomes what? overcomes those tendencies that we have to not like certain people because of the way they dress, because of their color, because of the way they wear their hair, because of the way they talk, because of where they come from, because of the way they think. Because all you're seeing is a shield that they use to protect themselves. But behind that, it's just a human being. Another one of your brothers and sisters that came from Adam and Eve, our parents. Could you imagine that if now every time we look at somebody, we say, that's my brother. He doesn't know it, but that's really my brother. <laughs> Come on. Isn't that true? Hmm? No matter who they are. Imagine if you just look at everybody, everybody human being right now and says, he don't know it, but he's my brother. She don't know it, but she's my sister. Huh? Wouldn't that change completely how we look at people? Wouldn't it change that? Wouldn't it change completely how we look at people? This is what uh, the church of Ephesus, the message to the church of Ephesus is about. Because it's a church, this is messages to the churches. And this is something that churches go through. And this is a problem the churches have. All right, people, God bless you. It's been a great Bible study has been a great time to be with you. And uh, remember, we're all the church. Each one of us. Each one of us is a church. Wherever we're at. Each one of us is. God bless each one of you. Happy Sabbath. I hope you have a great Sabbath. I'm going to be on tomorrow. I'm bringing you the message tomorrow at 11.15. So get ready, get ready. Right? Like T.D.J. says, right? Get ready, get ready, get ready. 
T.D. Jakes is one of my favorite preachers. I hope you guys know. Oh, man, I listen to that dude. What a preacher. Anyway, he's, a, he's an amazing, amazing, amazing preacher. Get ready, get ready, get ready. That's from him. <laughs> Tomorrow at 11.15, I will see you guys. I will see you guys, and please be there. Invite people, bring them on. Bring them on, okay? Bring them on. And um, I'm going to preach to you. Uh, I'm going to preach to you from uh, the next church. I'm actually going to continue tomorrow preaching. Um, and I'll preach to you the church of um, the next church, okay? The church of Smyrna. I'm going to preach to you about the church of Smyrna uh, this coming Sabbath. I think Pastor JC preached a sermon on the Church of Smyrna uh, a while back. And um, I'll preach it again. I'll preach it again from another view. That's the great thing about the scriptures, that you can do that. And, uh, and we'll all come together. Oh, we're going to preach for, we're going to uh, also uh, pray for Carrie. Carrie, she's one of our praise team leaders in church. She lost her dad. The funeral is on Sunday at the Ephesus Church here in West Palm Beach. Uh, so let us let us pray for Carrie and let us pray for uh, Merva again. Okay. Um, let us let us do that. Let us do that. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today. Lord, uh, we thank you for your word, and I know that Carrie has been, uh, is hurting right now for losing her dad, Lord. They've lost their dad to cancer. And I ask, Lord, that you may give the family wisdom, you may give the family understanding, that you may give them strength during this time. I ask you again, Lord, for Merva, that you may bring healing upon her, you may restore her kidneys, you may restore her heart, Lord, her blood pressure, you may restore all these things that have been hurt because of this infection, Lord. I ask you to please be with her, Lord, and restore her. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, people. God bless you. Uh, love you guys. Love you guys. And hopefully, we will see you all again tomorrow at 1115. People, come on. Let's pack it in. Let's pack it in tomorrow, 11.15. Tell everybody. Talk to people. Tell them to get on. All right. We'll see you. Bye-bye. God bless.